Those are instances where you literally have to just say, what do I need to do at this second to make sure I'm not getting stabbed or hit in the head? Hello, everyone. It's episode 76 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Sensei Jared Wilson. My name's Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, and I'm also your host for Martial Arts Radio. Whistlekick, as so many of you know already, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as really great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you checking us out again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you get over to whistlekick.com and take a look at what we make. Our sweatshirts are definitely one of our most popular items, available in both pullover and zip-up. We make sure everything that has our name on it is comfortable and top quality, and these are no different. I'm actually wearing a gray hoodie from our first round of sweatshirts right now, and it's three years old and still looks awesome. Now, if you want to see the show notes, those are on a whole different website, and that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. We only email a few times a month, and we never sell your information. I have a great podcast review to share with you today, and this one comes from C. Robinson. And C. says, Awesome show. I just finished listening to the episode with Cheyenne LaChapelle, who, in a word, is simply amazing. I really enjoyed hearing her martial arts journey, which started at an extremely young age. This was perhaps the third episode I've listened to, and they've all been wonderful. Me being a non-practitioner, just someone that enjoys quality podcasts, what always strikes me as being special about the martial arts community is just how much it has shaped the person they've become. The show is one of those that you can take something from, even if you aren't part of the target audience. Well, thank you for your kind words, C. Robison. Go ahead and shoot us an email, info at whistlekick.com, and we can get you your free pack of Whistlekick stuff. Remember, if we read your review on the air, that's all you have to do. Who doesn't like free stuff? Today we get to talk to someone that, in some ways, is very much a mirror of myself. Essentially, Jared Wilson is a martial artist, but he also hosts a podcast about the martial arts called Martial Thoughts. We became friends over social media and decided it would be fun to have each other on as guests. We've done that, and I really enjoyed my time talking with Sensei Wilson, both on his show and here on episode 76. So check it out. Sensei Wilson. Welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Hey, thanks for this opportunity to talk to you again. Hey, absolutely. This is going to be a lot of fun. And one of the things that I want to let everybody know right off the bat is that you and I kind of do the same thing. And everybody's out there going, wait, what, what does that mean? What does that mean? So I'll let you tell them what it is that you do that I also do. <laughs> <laughs> Sit around in our pajamas and record uh, radio shows. <laughs> um, that's a very literal answer, isn't it? <laughs> um, about, about three years ago, uh, my friends and I decided we wanted to do a martial arts podcast. And we've been doing, I've been kind of organizing it. We did about, I don't know, probably about 10 episodes together. And then uh, I took the liberty and decided I wanted to move to Nashville and have kept going with it. So for about the last three years, I've been doing Martial Thoughts, which is a, a martial arts podcast. Yeah. And of course... We've kind of met under the context of a blog post that we put out there. I don't even know how long ago it was now. It was, it was towards the end of last year mm -hmm. where we let people know that, hey, we're happy you're listening to martial arts radio. We're, we're glad that you're, you're letting my voice into your brain once a week, now twice a week. But we're not the only ones out there doing martial arts podcasts, and, and there are others doing it differently. And just like with different martial arts styles, everybody brings something to the table. So we put a po post out there. Of course, you were on it. You didn't even know we were doing that. You didn't have any idea who really we were at the time because we were the new kids on the block. And you know, because of that, we've had a chance to chat with some of the other podcast hosts out there, and, and now we get to have you on the show. Yeah, it's um... – it's one big internet world and we're all just a small part of it. So I have fun with it. Yeah, it is a good time. But of course, this episode isn't about the fact that you and I are, depending on your perspective, redundant to the world <laughs> or just um, applying different styles 
in in the same vein that the martial arts offers different styles. So this is about you. So let's dig into what you do. And how about you start by telling us about your start in the martial arts? I kind of came into it in a weird way. Um, I was always in, in sports all the way through high school. And I always noticed that, you know, for whatever reason, lack of uh, procrastination or whatever, my grades were always better when I was doing sports. So when I got to college, I went to University of Florida. There's no way I was going to do any sports there. Um, that's way too big of a university with too many scholarships going. So I decided I wanted to do something. And ironically, I decided I wanted to learn how to use swords. So in my head, and this is my, you know, preconceived notions of this, I decided I was going to learn how to use the best swords available. So I decided I was going to use how to learn how to use uh, Japanese katana. So I went looking around the university, seeing if there was anything. And I didn't know this at the time. I didn't realize what a unique opportunity this was. But there was a traditional Japanese uh, koru in town that happened to be teaching Japanese swordsmanship. Not kendo, but Japanese swordsmanship. And I studied that for about two or three years while I was there finishing up my degree. And then I, I went back home to South Florida, uh, started living down there. And I found uh, another place, same basic idea. I was looking for a sword school. And I ended up finding a place that does, uh, as part of their overall curriculum, they do jujitsu, they do Aikido, and then they do uh, the kenjitsu, the swordsmanship. And I adopted myself into there and have been doing that for well, altogether about 20 years. Um, just recently, I've moved up to Nashville. Well, recently, it's been a year and a half now. But uh, and so I decided I wanted to kind of go back to being a beginner again. And I decided I wanted to take uh, some Penjok Salat. Uh, ironically, because I heard about it on a, uh, I heard a very good description of it on a podcast interview. <laughs> it, they described it as being Wing Chun and Aikido meet, mixed together. So I'm like, oh, that sounds really cool. So let me go try that out. And I've been doing that for about six months now is the, the Silat. Oh, that's really cool. Now, was that a description on your show? I, well, was I, that another show? <laughs> it was actually, it was, a, it was a different show, but I ended up interviewing the author, um, uh, Steve Perry, not, not the guy from Journey. But <laughs> uh, he's got a. I'll, I'll plug his books because I've loved them. If you like martial arts science fiction, uh, he has the the Man Who Never Missed, the the Matador series. Um, they're short little. I don't want to say they're novellas, but they're short little paperback books. And he describes martial arts beautifully to the point where you realize the guy who wrote this knows martial arts. So I kind of tracked him down, and he was kind enough to actually do an interview on my show too. Oh, that's really cool. Oh, fun. Uh, when we get to the book section, tell us a little bit more about those <laughs> those books because that's a really different angle than any of our guests before have really taken taken books. We don't get a lot of fiction. Right. right. So that's a pretty good introduction to who you are and, and what makes you tick in terms of the martial arts. But, you know, you've heard the show mm -hmm. and all of our returning listeners know – it's about the stories here. We, we do everything we can to dig the best stories out of you and put them out there so people can blackmail you until the end of time. So why don't you tell us about your best martial arts story? Well, uh, this one will date me a little again, a, a little bit. But again, I was in University of Florida because I've had to th think about this because I've been preparing for this show. <laughs> um, it, one of the first things that we, we talk about in Aikido is the most valuable skill you learn in Aikido is actually how to fall down. You know, there's very little chance that you're going to actually be attacked and have to use any, you know, technique or anything like that. But there's a pretty good chance you're going to fall somewhere in your life. So and that's the part of, those, uh, of Aikido that I got to use. Um, that's going to date me. But I, I was rollerblading over to the bookstore. <clears throat> and ironically, hold on. That, that might be the oldest sentence <laughs> that's ever been uttered on this show. I rollerbladed to the bookstore. I'm sorry to take you out of that. That just no. I, ironically, I, I guess it, it left a, a memorable scar. But um, <laughs> I actually remember because I was getting a martial arts book and I still have the book over on my shelf. Um, I was rollerblading and you know in rollerblades you're going pretty good speed. And as I was rollerblading, I actually my front wheel caught in a crack in the sidewalk, 
So imagine like sprinting and then have someone grab your big toe and pull it out from under you. So, you know, of course I fell flat, but ironically, you, you know, my year of training, two years of training at that point, I did a perfect front fall and I had scrapes on my forearms, but that was about it. So <laughs> the story gets better because I went, I went to the bookstore, got the book, was on my way home. My mind was wandering, which again, there's a martial arts lesson for you. The exact same crack in the sidewalk, I fell in it on the way home. It did the exact same thing. And ironically, I actually fell the same way in it. <laughs> I've got scars on my forearm to show for it, but nothing broke. In fact, I actually rolled over and started laughing and because I realized where I was and a car actually pulled over to make sure I was okay. It was, it was hard to say yes through all the laughter at myself. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, there's there's so much that we could dig into there. I mean, <laughs> and I won't psychoanalyze it or anything, but man, the same crack, the same place, and you had the same response. <laughs> so it was good good training, if nothing else. Yeah. You're consistent. Yeah. <laughs> you can definitely say that. Now, did you continue rollerblading? <laughs> Believe it or not, this is again, this is gonna date me. I actually took a rollerblading class at college. <laughs> And, wow. and two semesters of fencing, so there's a good college education for you. Did you ever mix the two? <laughs> Do jousting on rollerblades? Yeah. That'd be a good idea. We should try that. I I don't... Did we just invent a new sport? <laughs> we could. Because we... I would totally do that. <laughs> if nothing else, I'd watch people do it. <laughs> All right. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can get something together that can have the first rollerblading roller gel thing sort roller gel there now there's a name <laughs> hold on I think we got to pause the episode while i go by roller jousting.com <laughs> just kidding <laughs> that's great stuff um there's i mean there's a couple other times where i've actually unintentionally you know used a joint lock on someone so i mean it has shown up in my life i teach high school by you know my mild mannered day job type of thing and i've actually had two kids that were getting in a pushing and shoving contest right in front of me. I grabbed one kid's wrist and actually held him in a, a, a control while I talked to the other kid. And I didn't even realize that I had him in a lock until I looked over and he was just staring at his own wrist, trying to figure out why he couldn't move. So, <laughs> I mean, there are little things like that that happen too. Now that's actually kind of an interesting topic and one that doesn't get discussed, I think, enough within the martial arts is is you know you as a school teacher there's a lot of things that you can't do i mean if you work at a conventional job you can have defensive aids right you know be they you know in a lot of cases you know be they firearms or a knife or pepper spray or a stun gun i mean there's a lot of you know lethal and non-lethal things that you can have that you can't have in a school whether you're your staff or a student so have you ha what what are your thoughts on because this keeps coming up right you know the, the idea of how do we how do we keep schools safe do you have any thoughts on on that and i know this is completely out of left field not on the sheet that i sent you yeah, that's fine um but I, you know you bring up a good point with the ability to to control and keep students safe but keep each other keep them safe from each other in that moment right and, and ironically i think that's kind of where some of the more controlling arts like aikido or jujitsu where because they're really, um, I've had a couple incidences in school where two kids are trying to, you know, get after each other and I have to get, well, legally, I'm not actually supposed to get in, involved. I'm supposed to just say, no, stop. But I mean, come on, as any real adult, you're going to step in between them. But um, I think that's where kind of the Aikido, the Jiu Jitsu, the joint lock type of thing actually comes into play, where if you can upset their center of balance, because first of all, their attention isn't on you. So all you have to do is just disrupt them enough to where they can't do something. I mean, that's all your really goal is for there. Um, on a personal level, I have a really nice heavy steel pin that I keep on my shirt collar in case something would happen. I kind of use it as a, uh, like a yawarate, like a little um, uh, a humbo, which is a, you know just a little stick just so you can use it on pressure points. I've never had to use that part of it, but and it's completely legal. I mean, it's a pen, so, but it's something I do keep on me just in case. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've found that that heavy pen is, is a great implement and 
couple years ago, I did a fair amount of international travel. And of course, what place are you more vulnerable <laughs> than on the inside of security <laughs> when you can't bring anything through? But the one thing I was able to get through was that metal pen you know, <laughs> that, on that wrote around in my pocket. On that, uh, on that same note, before um, before 9-11, I actually, I, I would literally walk on the plane with my boken, my, you know, wooden sword. Um, they x-rayed to make sure it wasn't a, you know, like a sword cane or something like that, but I put it in the overhead compartment. Um, <laughs> one time, one of the pilots wanted to take it up in the in the, the front just to make sure I wasn't going to do anything with it. But, so, I mean, that shows a little bit of our changing world. I, you know, I kind of killed build it where, you know, <laughs> you'd keep the sword with you on the plane type of thing. <laughs> Nice. And, you know, there's there's more and more conversation coming up. There seems to be this this return to people looking at the cane mm -hmm. as a great defensive tool because with the Americans with Disabilities Act, not only are you permitted to bring it on a plane, but it is actually federal offense, from my understanding, from the way it's been explained to me, it is a federal offense for security to even question your need for it. Mm. So for those of you out there that maybe travel a lot and, and feel a little bit anxious, there are people out there that are really great with a cane. Yeah. Check them out. Get some, get some education. So here we are. We're talking about all kinds of things, you know, with, with your life, with the martial arts threaded through it and how it's changed <clears throat> your, your views and, and your ability to help these children from beating the snot out of each other and, you know, bringing wooden swords on the planes. <laughs> Well, let's pretend, you know, let's go back and, and you never wanted to learn sword fighting. You never really cared about getting into the martial arts or you didn't have the opportunity. What do you think your life would look like now had you never started your training? Well, I think first and foremost, I'd be a lot more rounder. Uh, <laughs> I mean, just the physical part of it alone has <laughs> kept me in better shape than anything I probably would have done. Um, and, and I think that alone is probably worth the price of admission. That's worth the... You know, I, I saw a great thing online. It talked about how monetarily it doesn't make sense to take martial arts. You know, there's no amount of money you're going to carry in your wallet that's going to make it equal to all the months of tuition you've had to pay to try and stop them from taking your wallet. But, you know, if you include it as a, a, say, a gym membership and a meditation class and, a, you know, if you include all those things rolled in, then I think it does start to make sense. So I, I, I think it's actually kept me more active, more human. Um, uh, emotionally, it, it's actually a good stabilizing factor as well. So I'm a really calm person. I really tend not to, or I, I tend to not let my emotions take control of things. In fact, <laughs> my wife yells at me because the, the more emotional, the more crisis the situation is, the more I calm down. So I, I think I get that from, from martial arts. It's you, you can't panic when people are swinging swords at your head. It just doesn't work. You have to have a plan and you have to be able to breathe and do something. So I, I think those are the things I've gained from martial arts. I don't, I don't think I would have those if I didn't do that. Yeah, I think those are pretty valuable. And, and I think you really honed in on something good that we don't talk about a lot in the martial arts. It's that ability to stay calm and cool under pressure. And it's something that I think a lot of us experience, be it uh, a difficult physical situation or a difficult emotional situation. You know, when that pressure is applied, a lot of us just kind of fall in and, and the, the extraneous stuff falls away and we focus in on what's important because, of course, that's core to our training. Right. I mean, that's kind We're of learning how to not die. <laughs> or at least thinking about death. I mean, that actually that's a big part of it, too, you know you're sitting there trying to imagine what it would be like if I didn't do something here and my arm got cut off or, you know, I got hit in the gut and I was had to work from there. You know, that's a big part of it, too, is being able to think about those situations and being able to say, now what? What do I have to do to get past that? Right, right. Absolutely. So let's bring it back to our current actual timeline instead of this other parallel one where you haven't trained. And let's let's think about maybe some of the, the less positive aspects of your life, some of the challenging things that you've been through. And tell us about one of those and how your martial arts training or your experience in the martial arts has helped you overcome it. <clears throat> well, I, I 
I think I touched on some of that with the emotional control. Um, you know, a simpler thing is, you know, a fender bender. You know, they happen. People freak out about that. And just through martial arts, you're able to maintain that control. It's like, you know, go through the steps. Okay, is anyone hurt? No. Okay, well, now we need to do something rather than the emotional response, which is, you know, kind of everyone's instinct is to come out screaming and yelling and yelling about how you're going to sue someone, you know, keep calm about it. You know, that's the, that's honestly my most valuable part of martial arts is being able to deal with those difficult situations in a controlled, calm manner. Um, I, like you said, you know, I, I teach high school. So the fact that two kids are in a fight, I, you're able to calmly deal with that. It isn't an emotional response on my part. So I, I think that's the most, I don't know if I'm going to say difficult part of it, but th those are the difficult parts in your life you have to be able to get through. And not making it an, um, an immediate emotional response uh, is the most valuable part of that. Is there anything that you've found to be particularly helpful in your training to separate the emotion from a situation? I'm, I'm not really sure how it happens, but at some point, um, and especially with Aikido with, with Randori, which is where you have, you know, multiple attackers. Um, <laughs> on my black belt test in particular, you're supposed to have, um, you're supposed to do a Randori against uh, a staff, a Randori against a sword, and then Randori against a knight. So on my test in particular, uh, my instructor goes, uh, we're running out of time. Uh, all three of you guys attack them all at once. So... <laughs> So that was an, an incident where I went, crap, and had to figure out what to do. Because uh, that wasn't the way I trained, and those are three very different lengths you have to worry about. Um, so you don't have time to get emotional with it. Those are instances where you literally have to just say, what do I need to do at this second to make sure I'm not getting stabbed or hit in the head? <laughs> so and I only died twice on that test, so it was actually a pretty good test. you know. <laughs> That's pretty good. So how do you defend against a sword, a, a knife, and a staff at the same time? <laughs> well, in, in Aikido, one of the things we like to do is we like to throw people in the way of the other person. So it kind of takes one person out and then makes him a barrier for the second one so that you can deal with the third one. Then you put him in, in the way of the first one so you can deal with the second one. And it kind of just – you kind of build this pattern of uh, you're not staying in the middle of them and you're kind of putting themselves in their own way. So it, it actually ends up – once you get used to the, the pattern, once you get used to how to set it up, it's actually not that bad. It's just not your first instinct. Right. And it's actually one of my favorite drills is that multiple attacker, especially at a slow speed, especially, you know, giving the opportunity to really think through mm -hmm. what you're doing. And I've traveled to a lot of schools and it's amazing to me when I teach that, how few of them have done it before. And it's something that, you know, for the, Anybody out there that runs their own school or has control over some of the, the the class format, I would encourage you to implement that. You know, two on one sparring. You know, just it, there, if you want to watch students that think they know what they're doing that have never done it before, freak out. Give them two attackers or more. Yeah, and and watch a lot of what they rely on just fall apart. So, you know, you're, you're, you're training in a whole different style now, but I'm sure as you, you think on what you have learned in the martial arts, it's primarily Aikido. Mm -hmm. And you've got your Aikido instructors and now your Salat instructors. But if we were to take them out of the mix, who would you say has been the most influential in your martial arts upbringing? Um, well, it, it if you go back and listen to the show, his name is Rick. He's on the one of the, the co-hosts on the early episodes. Um, he wasn't my, the top instructor at our school, but he was an instructor at our school. Um, and he actually did a lot to show me how to make Aikido work. And I don't mean in a class situation, I mean in a more realistic with resistance. And he's always gonna be above me rank wise. I mean, he's, the, he's a much better martial artist than I am. Uh, just don't tell him I said that, but, um, <laughs> I, I <won't. laughs> um, once I got to my showdown and we became more, more peers and we became really good friends, 
we started to experiment together. And I think that was the my my real opening of idea of how Aikido and how martial arts works. Uh, we'd read books and we'd go, okay, well, let's see, what does he say with this part? Oh, that's what he was talking about. Here's how it works. Um, and we'd actually go back and forth with little things we discovered like that. And, and that was actually one of the biggest influences is to have a lab partner, for lack of a better term, someone you can experiment with and someone you trust enough to say, well, this isn't working, let's try something else. Or it's like, well, okay, that one didn't work. Uh, let's go with this one. Oh, that one really worked, but how would you get into that situation? You know, so I think having that, that someone you can experiment freely with, that's an important part of martial arts training, especially with Aikido where it's, you know, kind of a two person thing. We don't have kata in Aikido, uh, or I should say, we don't have single man kata in Aikido. We have two man kata, which means you got to practice with someone. So having that other person is a real important part. Mm, that's interesting. And that's, that's something I didn't know. I've done very little Aikido, but it's always been in a seminar format where there have been plenty of other people, but I guess it makes a lot of sense because forgive me if I'm, if I'm misspeaking, but the majority of what you're learning in Aikido requires that response, that feedback from someone else. Right. You're trying to feel their motion, their, they use the word energy, and I hate that word, but their energy of how they're moving, and you're trying to direct it. So, yeah, you you do need another person to actually practice the Aikido part of it. And so to practice it solo could almost be counterproductive because you're, you're setting in paths that may or may not, might not be true. Work at all. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Interesting. I hadn't considered that, but it makes a lot of sense now that you say it. Well, it'd be like if, uh, you know, you were practicing, you know, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu by yourself. It's like, yeah, <laughs> it looked kind of funny, too. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that maybe that's why, uh, at least my limited experience with, with Jiu-Jitsu, with Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, spent the first, I think it was the whole class, just kind of shrimping back and forth, if anybody knows what that oh, is. Oh, yeah, we do shrimping. It, <laughs> okay, really, that's, tiring drill. Really, that's tiring. just a way to clean the mats. Don't, don't let anyone tell you <laughs> That's all it is. Man, and here I was wearing my white. <laughs> so how about competition? Have you done done any uh, any time out on the mats? Um, Aikido specifically is a non-competition martial art. It's actually in the, the dogma of Aikido that there isn't competition. Aikido does not have competition. Those are words from uh, the founder of the system. Um, now, on the sword part, uh, the Kenjutsu part, I've actually, I haven't participated, but I actually have gone to several uh, cutting competitions. Uh, Tomei Shigiri, which is where they roll up the, the straw mats and they do the cutting on those. And that's a fascinating part. And I, I practiced the Tomei Shigiri, but I've never competed in that part of it. Uh, it's just never been part of my martial arts journey. Nothing for or against it. Just haven't done it myself. Is it something you, you perhaps see yourself engaging in in the future? Yeah. Um, you know, like I said, the sword is kind of how I came into martial arts in general. So I'd, I'd love to get to the point where I could actually compete with it. Um, but my skill is nowhere near the level of the, the people who actually do it. I mean, it's scary the way how good they are and how precise they are at these cuts. So Now, I've never seen a, a cutting competition like that. And I'm going to guess there's at least a few of the listeners out there that haven't either. So could you tell us just a quick minute what a competition like that looks like yeah it kind of uh it's kind of based on a bracket system so they usually divide it up as kind of um like let's say for example blowback black belt then they'll have uh shodan and nidan first on uh, first level black belt second level black belt is one competition and then i think sandan and above is the third one and uh, uh the ones i'm referring to the ones i've seen was actually through uh toyamaru batodo which is a traditional modern Japanese sword system, I guess is the best way to say it. Uh, and those were in Orlando and then they still have those who actually, but what did you have is like I said, it's kind of a bracket system. So you have two competitors come up to the stand and there's about a, I don't know, about a three inch wooden spike. That's kind of, you, you, you roll up this straw mat. Uh, it's the tatami, the ones that the Japanese use on their, their uh, floors. So it, it's a very specific size. You roll it up, you soak it in water for a week ahead of time. And it, the idea is it's supposed to have the consistency of cutting through an arm, <laughs> which is a lovely thought. Um, 
you take the mat, you spike it on the wind spike. So it's standing on the stand. It's kind of held in place. And depending on which level of competition you're at, it's either going to be a, uh, a six stroke pattern, a six cut pattern or a five cut pattern. The lower levels do the five cut pattern because it gives you a little bit more leeway on as where the cutting uh, can take place. Um, there's rules that the, the angle of the cut is supposed to be 45 degrees and they judge it based on how close it is to that angle. Um, if you've never cut with a Japanese sword, they, they'll cut through it, but this is to the getting to the point of the competition where if it dips a little bit in the cut or if the cut is at a slightly wrong angle, then they kind of take points off for it. And there's three judges usually. And they'll basically, looking at the five cuts or the six cuts, they'll say which person did the best set of cuts, and then they'll go from there and they say, okay, that person goes on to the next bracket. So that's kind of how the competitions work, or at least the ones that I've seen. That sounds like a lot of fun, really interesting stuff. And as someone who has really only played with a sword, I, I won't even say I've trained with a sword, that <laughs> You know, that, that stuff just sounds really impressive. Hopefully I can check something out like that. Yeah, I mean, it, it's incredibly detail-oriented. Um, if you hit the, the the wooden spike that's holding it on there, that automatically means you lose. So, I mean, that, there's very strict rules about the angle of the cuts, how you're supposed to cut, and it's a pattern. So, like I said, if it's five cuts, it might be one going downward angle from the, the left to the right. The next one will be going from the right to the left. Next one will be right to the left. And then one will be straight across or something like that. So there's a very specific set pattern that you have to do. And is that pattern different at different competitions? Yeah, it depends on uh, who's putting forth the, the competition. So, you know, one system might have one particular pattern, one will have another, but it's generally pretty similar. If you go to one, one cutting competition, you could probably go to the next one and do and learn their pattern real quick. Interesting. So let's pretend that you have not only unlimited funds, but a time machine <laughs> and you get the ability to train with any martial artist ever. Who would that be? Well, there, there's a couple of people. I mean, obviously I would like to, you know, at least kind of separate the man from the myth for Bruce Lee. I mean, there's so much you hear about him I, and I know he was a human. So I know some of that had to have been exaggerated, but at the same time, some of that had to have been true, too. So it would have been nice to kind of hear some of the, the words from his mouth, so to speak. And because, you know, he was cut short, there's only a, a limited time frame of what we were able to learn. And, and a lot of that stuff kind of gets repeated to the point of, of legend, basically. Um, so he'd definitely be one of the ones you'd, you'd kind of just want to, you know, learn from the sermon, so to speak. Um, because I do Aikido. I, I, I know you're supposed to say, you know, Sensei, the guy who founded Aikido, but <laughs> everything I've read on him says he was kind of nutty. Um, you know, Aikido, especially in the readings of it, has these really esoteric ideas to the point where nobody can really understand what it is he was talking about. So personally, um, I actually like a, one of his students. His name is Gozo Shioda, who kind of made Aikido a practical martial art and instead of concentrating on the more esoteric, the key idea, he kind of said, well, that's great, but you have to be able to walk away from a fight at the end of the night. So, <laughs> and I like his aspect of it. Um, he's one that I'd really like to be able to said that I've learned from. Um, let's see, there's, and then uh, in on the jujitsu side of the Atemi root, my, you know, my root system here, um, my instructor's instructor, Dr. Moses Powell, who's yeah, a relatively big name. If you look him up, he's... Yeah, you know, we've talked about him on the show before. Yeah, um, he's my instructor's instructor. So I got the chance to meet him at a seminar. But when I saw him, he had already had... Um, I think at that point he had, had both hips replaced. And he wasn't the same man that the legend says he was. So I would have liked to seen him in his prime, too. Yeah, those are, I mean, absolutely great answers to that question. And I, th I think you bring up an interesting point in not, you know, in questioning that automatic answer, should I train with the founder of a style? <laughs> because I think sometimes the founder of the style 
has has these great ideas, but they're not always the best at that first level of refinement. Right. You know, kind of that. Uh, there's there's a saying in in business that it's often better to be the second person, to, the second business to market with an idea, because you get to see the mistakes made by the first uh, effort. Right. And we had uh, just a couple weeks ago, we had um, Professor Gary Dill, who trained at Bruce Lee's school in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And we spent some time talking about how he felt that he benefited not training directly with Bruce Lee, but with Bruce Lee's number one guy yeah. because of it, his, his ability to understand it and teach it better and make those minor refinements from Bruce Lee's ideas. Yeah, that's that's one of the things I've learned, you know, through my years of martial arts is just because you're a great martial artist does not mean you're a great instructor. Those are two completely separate skill sets. And, you know, just because you get a black belt doesn't mean you should really be called sensei just because and we've almost used that in at least in American systems as a rank. It's like, well, you're a black belt and I get to teach a class. Well, that's great, but I have no training in how to teach a class. So <laughs> it's interesting you bring that up. Just yesterday, I was, and, and I'm not going to bring any names into this mix because some of these names are names that have come up on the show. I was just speaking with someone yesterday about that exact subject, and we were friendly debating on how that could be handled. And I would, I would like to see almost sep. I don't want to say separate, but similar tracks because not everyone's interested in teaching. I mean, I think there's tremendous benefits in teaching. I think if you learn how to teach something, you understand it so much better and you can apply it better yourself. We actually, in at, at the Atemi Ru, the, the, jiu the Jiu Jitsu and Aikido system that I do, we actually have that. We have instructor ranks and we have black belt ranks. Now, is there any requirement for tying the two together or can you just stay on one track versus the other well it, it's we have people at our school that like you said they they want to do the martial arts but they have no intention of ever teaching it so they're technique wise they're not taught any differently but they're not given the opportunity to teach a um at our school we're 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 fairly loose like our head instructor um uh we call him doc because it's dr philip chenique is <laughs> it's his name He'll start off a class, but then he'll start asking some of his senior students to come up and say, OK, now you teach the next class. Build off of that thing that I just did. You know, I uh, we did a wrist lock. Build off the wrist lock. So he kind of, I don't know, gives you a trial period on, on how to teach before, you, you know, you're actually given your, your sensei rank. So that, that's an interesting way to do it. And I have not really heard that that kind of is the way it works with other schools. Um, there's some people that just want to learn the martial art to learn the martial art. They have no intention of teaching it. They don't really want to open a school anywhere. So they get their show done. They get their black belt, and that's exactly where they want to be. So, Yeah, I think that it's something that I would love <laughs> to see us as the martial arts realm discuss a lot more because I see the skill set for teaching – to be just as different and have just as much complexity as the ability to learn forms or fighting or self-defense. I mean, these are all separate and distinct things. And the, just because you can do it doesn't mean you can teach it. What's that? That, um, especially to you, I, I guess, mildly offensive <laughs> statement. Those who can do, those who can't teach, right? Yeah, I, I kind of cheat because my high school or my day job is a high school teacher, so. You know, it, it, on that same note, it, it's kind of funny is when I started getting ready to to take my shodan, I actually I, I got a couple of books on how to teach martial arts. And I learned more about teaching theory than I did ever actually in my teaching classes. So <laughs> so there you go. There's another way martial arts has helped me out. I actually learned how to teach from it. That That's really cool. So how much how much time did you have as a high school teacher before your, your showed on or, or where, where, how did those tie together time wise? Um, I probably had about five years of teaching high school before I got my showed on. So somewhere right in that range. And if you could make a couple, I guess, time machine changes. 
What's that? Time machine changes? <laughs> well, no, not, not quite that. I mean, we don't have a lot of people that have the, the opportunity to teach different things. I mean, you're teaching high school primarily, but I expect that you probably have some time that you're instructing in your dojo. Yeah. Um, Even if, if just casually. Yeah. So I'm going to guess that you're probably a pretty good teacher because you're teaching different things in different ways to different groups of people. And if you could boil off a couple bits of advice to people out there that might be listening and saying, oh man, you know, they're right. I, I, I'm a pretty good martial artist, but I really don't <laughs> feel confident when I'm in the front of the class. You know, what bits of wisdom could you give those folks? This is something that I, it took me a long time to figure out in the dojo is, and, and you know, it's one of those kind of like old, you know, climb up to the top of the mountain and, and hear the words of wisdom from the old guy type of movie thing. But not everybody is ready for all the information at the beginning. Um, you know, you kind of have to space out. So even if you're teaching one technique, um, you show them kind of, you build it up in steps. You go, okay, here's the basic footwork for it. Okay, now we got that. Now do the wrist. Okay, that's good. Now do this, you know, make sure you're balanced. Okay, now do this. As opposed to trying to correct everything all at once. And I think that's a, a, a fault of a lot of martial arts instructors is we want to correct everything all at once rather than allow them to concentrate on the little pieces of a technique. Um, and build that up for it is you don't overwhelm them with all the information. Um, the other thing that I've, I've really learned from martial arts, and I actually have taken this into my high school class, is there's, there's a point in martial arts. Before this point, what people are really wanting is encouragement. They want to know they're doing the right thing, that they're, they're progressing, they're getting better. At some point, there gets to be a switch where you're like, okay, now stop giving me, you know, stop blowing smoke. Uh, now start critiquing me. Get me better at it. And finding that balance point for everyone, where they want to get better and where they just want encouragement is a, is a really delicate thing. And it's an individual thing. Not everybody's going to be the same on that. So those are the two things I've learned most about teaching. Mm. You know, as you were kind of describing that and the refinement, I had this this analogy pop into my head. And for some of the younger listeners, this might not resonate as much. But for the rest of us that remember dial-up internet, <laughs> when you would go to a website that had a, a picture, and that picture was 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 big, there was a big file size, lots of lots of dots also, in that picture. I know where you're going with this. <laughs> and it would come up, and it would be really blurry, and you couldn't even tell what it was. And then as it downloaded more and more, it it would the picture would get clearer and clearer and clearer. Until eventually, oh, that's what it is. And then oftentimes it would get continue to get clearer. And I think that as instructors, we need to be a little more patient and let that unveiling happen within people. If we drill in too much, they can get frustrated. They can walk away. So, so we shouldn't give belts. We should just say, okay, you're a four-bit Aikido person. You're an eight-bit Aikido person. <laughs> I wasn't going to take it quite to that geeky of a place because <laughs> listeners know. I mean, that that is my background. I, I do have quite a few years in, in IT, but yeah, for for I, I know there are a few, at least a few out there that are are just as geeky, and we'll get that reference. Yeah, it's <laughs> yeah. I, now I'm speechless. That that's just perfect. I love it. <laughs> that's awesome. I love it. <laughs> so let's talk about entertainment and martial arts entertainment. You, you mentioned those books earlier. We'll talk about that in a second, but let's talk about movies. Are you at all a martial arts film fan? Oh yeah. Um, if you, if you read the blog site that goes with the web, with the, uh, the podcast, I do movie reviews on there too. Um, I, I, I collect them. I go to use movie places and buy all the old bad Kung Fu movies. I buy all the samurai stuff. I'm, I, there's a lot of new countries that are actually making really good martial arts movies too that are kind of breaking into that scene. So I'm, I'm enjoying some of those as well. So give us some some specifics. Okay. You know, My, how about a couple movies maybe that people haven't heard of that you would say are are worth seeking out? Start there. Okay. Um, there's one that I just saw. Uh, it was it's actually on Netflix. Is where I saw it. You know, cruising through all the martial arts movies on Netflix. It's called. Um, 
uh, crap was it? It was uh, something about the Golden Cane Warrior, I think is the name of it. I think that's what it was, is the Golden Cane Warrior. And it's out of Indonesia. So, you know, that made me think of the raid and it made me think of Silat, which is why I actually found the movie in the first place. Uh, so that's what kind of what I was looking for. But it ended up having a very, very like old school kung fu feel to it, almost a, a crouching tiger kind of feel where everything is kind of more operatic in it. And on that one, I really dug it. Uh, the martial arts was decent. It was almost all staff work, which was kind of an interesting thing. They had almost no empty hand. It was almost all staff work. But um, the movie itself was actually really, really nicely done. Um, like I said, they were trying to go for that really grand, big scope of things. And I think it worked out really well. That sounds kind of fun. And yeah, I think it's interesting you bring up that other countries are getting into the martial arts film game and I'm, I'm starting to see more on that because it was for the longest time it was i mean really for a long time it was just hong kong yeah china is starting it's to do their to own ripple. stuff you know the the samurai films came out in japan but uh like ong bok thailand was starting to do some of the martial arts films indonesia is starting to get into them recently i've seen a couple from uh from korea um uh, kundo is one that i i bought probably a couple of years ago that's actually a, a really good martial arts film and then uh, what was the one I just oh, I'm in the middle of watching on Netflix um, Memoirs of the Sword, which is, again, another kind of big operatic one. But I'm pretty sure that one's Korean as well. So I'm starting to see, you know, the other Asian countries are starting to go, well, hey, if they're doing this, why, why doesn't our film industry get in on this action? Right. And one of the things that you and I were talking about before we started the episode was this growth of martial arts outside of the traditional three, right? I mean, when we think about traditional martial arts, most people gravitate towards thinking about Japanese arts and Chinese arts and Korean arts. Right. But here we have all of these other things in a, popping up. I, mean, I shouldn't say popping up because they've been there for a long time, but coming to the, the more global consciousness. And I wonder how much tie there is between that and the movies. You know, are the movies following that consciousness or is it the other way? And I don't know. Well, I think besides that, I think the Internet is helping a lot. Um, you know, it used to be, you know, before we're talking about our dial up days, uh, you literally had to like go to a phone book and just kind of look through the martial arts and see what was there. Nowadays, you can search and, you know, and I've like uh, there's no in I'm in Nashville and there's no C lot teacher in Nashville. But the next city over is Murfreesboro. And that's where I go to teach. And it's. I don't know, about 25 miles away, but I would never would have found that if I didn't have the internet. So I think the internet's actually connecting us more that way. Um, and I think we're able to see more of what's actually available, more of the stuff that's actually has survived and is spread around. Like we are talking about the European stuff is actually starting to sneak up on us. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, maybe this is a good point to, to kind of step out and, and bring up um, – that point that I brought up, because I, I think it's an interesting conversation, one I haven't had with anyone before. When I think back to this timeline I have in my head, uh, at least, of the shift, what I see as a shift in the awareness in the martial arts realm for, again, martial arts outside the traditional three countries, mm -hmm. the first thing that I think of is Krav Maga. And you can certainly have a, a conversation whether or not Krav Maga is or is not a martial art, is it a defense system, and I don't know that it matters for, for what we're talking about here because here we have something that's coming out of a completely non-traditional space that is resonating for people, and I think it made people take a step back and say, what else is out there? Right. Yeah, so that might have been the, the opening of the door for us. Yeah, so, I mean, who knows what else is going to pop up? I mean, are, are, are we going to suddenly start seeing capoeira schools <laughs> on every corner, which I think would be a lot of fun. I, I did a few years at capoeira. I <laughs> had a really good time with it. Um, by the way, I think that one's been out there because, you know, only the strong. Right. <laughs> Have you seen that movie? Yeah. So maybe that's it. Maybe it's uh, once something's featured in the movie, then it starts to become more prevalent. There we go. So that that's your instruction manual out there for any – one that wants to start a martial arts style is you have to develop the style and then you have to make a movie <laughs> and that if you can get that movie on netflix <laughs> there you, go. you are good to go and so you can start teaching seminars and make some money <laughs> 
So let's come back. I mean, that was that was a fun tangent. Let's bring it back for a second. Now, out of all these movies that you like, is there one that might be a little more traditional? You know, something a, a bit more mainstream that you would tap and say of the films that other people have heard of. Right. right? This one's my favorite. Yeah, my my go to is always going to be Fist of Legend um, with Jet Li and. And I, I recently I've come to realize why I like that one so much, and it, it took me a while to figure it out. Is it it doesn't just have uh, movie food. It doesn't have just the movie food style. It actually shows you different martial arts styles and how they attack and defend, which is it's something that's kind of rare in martial arts um, and martial arts movies. It like Ip Man too when he has to go against the, the Council of Grandmasters and he's standing on the table. If you pay attention, he's specifically doing Wing Chun style Kung Fu. Uh, uh, Samo Hung is doing Bagua. I mean, they're doing different styles of attack and defend. It's not just the, again, the only thing I can call it is movie Fu, where you know all the movements are basically the same, they just call it different things. You know, I'm doing double dragon fist and stuff like that, but. <laughs> they're actually showing you how different styles interact. And I think that's a cool thing that, um, that uh, Fist of Legend actually gets, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a great movie, It Man 2, that table scene. I mean, you mentioned that, and of course, I did a big smile because that, out of the series, is probably my favorite scene. It's just so well done and just so fun you know you know i really enjoy creative use of, of props and scene, scenery on uh, a, a very specific fight scene that i really really dug was actually in um uh the the second ninja movie with scott atkins i think it's called shadows of a tear i think it's in the, the subtitle of it there's a scene where he walks into the the dojo and he's looking for someone and it takes you a minute to realize it but the whole minute and a half fight scene is all one shot they never switch camera angles. And you just realize that something's weird about that because it's the guy, the guy who the, the director is actually a martial artist. So he knows how to film martial arts fights, you know, pull the camera back a little bit, stop, you know, stop, stop cutting, make it actually look like it's smooth and there's action going on. So he, that is a really cool fight scene. If you can, if anyone wants to watch that one, that was a really well done fight scene. The movie itself is good, but that one fight scene was a really excellent. We'll see if we can dig that up and put that over on the show notes for new listeners. Mar Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You know, we put all this stuff over there. I'm, I'm going to try and find some video of a sword cutting competition. Put that over there too because I want to check that out myself. I'll see if I can send you some links for that one. That one should I, I might actually find some of the ones I went to. Oh, that would, that would be great. Yeah, please. So those are some good movies. You know, gave people a good uh, homework assignment there to watch some of those those lesser known movies. That's a good homework assignment, yeah. though. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, what's better? I, I would have loved that in high school and college. <laughs> now, how about actors? Is there anybody that really pops up for you as being your favorite? Um, you know, honestly, the uh, our our C lot school actually has a a connection with one of the guys from Raid Two, from Chechep uh, uh, Raman, who is the the guy's got the little goatee at the end of the raid two. He's got the, the two uh, karambits, the knife bite seat at the very end. And mm -hmm. so I've been watching a lot of stuff on him and he's a phenomenal guy, but uh, the main actor in the raid is he shows up in a lot of things. And actually was in the last star. Actually, all three of them were actually in the last star Wars movie. So that was a cool little bit there too. Um, Eco Oias is his name. He's, I actually like him a lot. You know, he's a newer face, but I'm I'm digging what he's doing. He was actually in the man in uh, the man from Tai, the man of Tai Chi with the Keanu Reeves movie. He was one of the the competitors at the end on that one too. Oh, cool! Sounds like a guy who's kind of been behind the scenes and is now coming into his own. Yeah, and he's just got he's got a good presence. He's kind of like Jet Li in that even if he's just doing a fight scene, there's there's content in what he does with it. So I, I appreciate that aspect of it. Yeah, yeah, that definitely adds a lot to a film. And anytime you can be mentioned in the same sentence as Jet Li, you're, you know you're doing pretty good. You are doing very well. <laughs> <laughs> now let's go back to those books that you mentioned towards the beginning of the episode. What were the what was the name of those again? Um, it's by Steve Perry. There's I think eight or nine of them. It's a it's a series of them. Um, they're called the first one is called The Man Who Never Missed, 
And the whole series is called the Matador series. And it's a space opera, so it, it's a different take on it. And they mention all sorts of martial arts, but they have this um, made up martial art. And if you listen to the Unity Run my episode, he talks about how he thought he was making up all these ideas and making, making up a martial art. And then he found uh, a style of Salat that has all the same things he thought he made up. So <laughs> I, I, unintentionally, he was using uh, <laughs> Salat in his books. And then he started practicing and he started putting more of it into the book. So I, that, that one's what, that's why that one's got a special place in my heart. But they're, what I love about those books in particular is he talks about the physical and the mental setup that the guy does. You know, just because you throw that punch, it's not intended to hit. It's intended to get you to react so that you can do a grab and actually break something or, you know, something like that. Uh, and I thought that was just brilliantly done with that in all the books. They talk about the the training of it pretty well too. Those sound interesting. Definitely going to check those out. We will definitely link to the episode where you interviewed the author. I think that adds a lot of a lot of interesting context for anyone that wants to check out those books. And as you're talking about the books, I'm realizing that why is it that that we as martial artists, whenever we start to write a book, it's got to be factual. It has to be instructional. <laughs> I don't know of too many martial arts fiction books. Yeah, there's there's a couple around. Um, there's actually a, a series of mysteries called the Aikido Mysteries, um, and where the martial arts isn't necessarily the center point of it, but it's definitely a, a an important part of it. Um, there's another one I can't think of it off the top of my head. It was uh, Sensei was the name of the first book. I can't think of what the name of the series is right now, but. Uh, that one actually is centered around the martial arts. Uh, the martial arts is the center of the mystery in the first book. But yeah, it, it's one of those things. It's like we like martial arts movies. We love this over-the-top ideas. Maybe it just doesn't translate as well into books. Maybe that's why. It's a visual medium. Maybe. Maybe. I, I, I have no idea. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we love to get really creative in movies. I mean, what's the the number one, I believe the number one, grossing martial arts film globally it's the original crouching tiger hidden dragon mm -hmm. we don't have too many movies that are more fantastic with the martial arts application than that I mean, fighting at the top of trees right. <laughs> but the, the moment we put pen to paper it's 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 got to be here's how what you're doing is wrong and here's how to do it right well some of that might be cultural because crouching tiger is actually based off uh, a novel it's in it's in chinese and I, as far as I know, it's a part four out of a five series uh, book series, and I don't think those are translated into English yet. So I think part of it is we've just gotten away from this idea that martial arts is part of our culture. You know, whereas opposed to, like you said, China, Korea, Japan, it's just been in their culture for so much longer and so much more recently it's been relevant. So maybe that's part of it. I think you may have just offered a pretty good insight there and I'm not even going to try and <laughs> add anything to it because I've got nothing. I think you're right. And that's something that I'm going to go contemplate. It's good stuff. See, martial thoughts, thinking martially. Hey, <laughs> that's why we brought, that's why we brought you on. You bring a different perspective. And I think this is great, you know, meeting of the minds and we're all better because of it. So what's keeping you going? What's keeping you training? Do you have goals? Are there things you're trying to accomplish? Well, like I said, I, I just started uh, my sea lot training. I've only been doing it for about six months. So I'm enjoying being a beginner again and having absolutely no clue what I'm doing, having to learn a new culture, a new language to describe everything. Um, and that's actually part of what I was going for. You know, I could have uh, actually, ironically, there's actually three like branches of our school. And one of them happens to be about 30 minutes away from here. Uh, of my, the Atemi Rue. So I could have actually continued with what I was doing and I still go down there sometimes and practice with them, but I wanted to be a complete beginner again. I wanted to have to start from the beginning because that offers a whole new set of challenges rather than just saying, oh, well, let me just continue what I'm doing. So I, and ironically, um, I had read somewhere along the lines that it's talking about, uh, and it, was, it was kind of making fun of Aikido. It said Aikido because eventually everyone gets old. <laughs> <laughs> you know that was their tagline on their poster whatever it was and, and I thought about it and they were talking about how basically 
almost everyone ends up going to a softer system as they get older. And I, and I thought about it. It's like, well, I started at the soft system. So what does that say about me? So I wanted to go back and actually go to a harder system when I, <laughs> after I've been doing this for a while. And I actually wanted to learn how to put in all these strikes and all the fun bits like that. So that, that's kind of what I'm doing is I want to I want to go back and learn some of the stuff that I missed from the Aikido. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that all martial arts have something to offer. Oh, yeah. And that when you spend some time, you know, 20 years as you have doing one style to go to something pretty opposite is going to give you the most benefit. Mm -hmm. Now, did you pick Salat because you had that kind of a mindset? You know, what what is the opposite martial art to Aikido? Well, I, I was specifically looking for something that was involved a lot of striking um, because it, there is striking in Aikido and, you know, that's a whole separate issue, but uh, you don't, it's not trained that way anymore, but there is striking in there. It's hidden, but I wanted something that was, that was their primary focus was a striking art. So I looked at a couple of things. I looked at um, a, a karate school that was around. I looked at a, a, a Southern Praying Mantis uh, Kung Fu school. And honestly, I don't know how I settled on Silat, but that, <laughs> that just attracted me to it. Um, physically, a lot of the handwork, like I said, looks a lot like Wing Chun. There's a lot of similarities. And I, I don't, again, like you said, I don't really want to say I trained in it, but one of the one of the people at Temi Ru is also an instructor of Wing Chun, so we had a little bit of exposure to that. So I could at least recognize, like, that's the same idea that's going on there. So it, it's the idea of Silat that's actually more interesting to me than it's it's a striking art, but it's very intellectually difficult. <laughs> I'll put it that way. Mm, interesting. Yeah, and I think we'll have to find. Maybe you can offer up some good resources for people that are not familiar with Salat that we can include in the show notes, you know, video or, or a web page or something to just kind of give people a primer. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that, I'll give that, send that over to you. Appreciate that. So now is kind of your commercial time. So, you know, we know a little bit about what you've got going on. You've got, you've got this great podcast that I hope everybody will check out. So tell us a little bit about more about that, how they can <laughs> find you. Someone wants to contact you directly, you know, whatever you want to tell us. Okay. Well, the podcast, the easiest way is to go onto Stitcher or iTunes and just search martial thoughts. Um, it does show up if you just put in martial arts, but it's, I don't know, you know the, the black magic that is iTunes. I have no idea how they rank them, but I'm, I'm in there somewhere. Uh, if you put in martial thoughts, you can find it that way. Or if you go to the, the blog site that I have, which is uh, thinkingmartial.blogspot.com, just because apparently somebody had taken martial thoughts blogspot.com. And if I find them, I'm going to kick them in the shins. But... Um, <laughs> I, besides the, the, besides the podcast, I do a lot of book reviews, uh, and whenever I catch a new martial arts movie, I put up a review on there too, or, you know, some weird ideas that just kind of strike my fancy. I'll put up a blog post about that. Uh, you can get there through the blog site, uh, facebook.com slash martial thoughts. You can find us there. Um, I, I do have a Twitter account, which is at martial thoughts. And then the email is just um, martialthoughts at gmail.com. So it should be all pretty easy, except for that blog spot where it's thinking Marshall. Well, maybe we can track down <laughs> whoever that guy is. That. We, can, we can beat them with a stick, uh, maybe a bowhead. Uh, if, if that seems the appropriate tool, I'm going to send them your way because you are certainly more skilled with that tool than I am. But that's great stuff. And, and you know, I, I really hope everyone out there will check out what you're doing and, and you know, cause we're, we're doing some different stuff. I mean, you, you're doing different things and we're doing over here. And, and I think that's great. And I think that there's room for all of us. I think, you know, one of the sad things is that if we took the show and, and your show and uh, we've talked about uh, Sensei Endo's mm -hmm. um, half fight for a happy life, happy, happy, half fight for a happy life podcast and, and the high guys and all the guys that, you know, we mentioned on that blog post if we added all of our listenership up, we wouldn't come anywhere close to some of the worst <laughs> podcasts out there. And I'm not going to name names because I will end up offending someone. But yeah, I, I think if we can let our community know, hey, you know what? What we're doing is great, the martial arts overall. And there's a lot more to our culture as martial artists than just reading some books and watching some movies and training 
in the school. There's there's a whole bunch of us out there doing other things to add value to our what I consider a lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And you're right on the forefront of that, and I appreciate it, not just as as your peer, but as a martial artist. So thank you. But before we tie up, you got any parting words of words of wisdom for us? Well, kind of on the same note of everything we've been talking about. Um, one of the things, and there's nothing wrong with either one, but you know, you're talking about making martial arts your lifestyle versus, say, the hobby guy that just comes in because it's Tuesday and it's martial arts day. You know, from his point of view, it could be bowling night or whatever it happens to be. Um, make martial arts, make learning martial arts a a active participation. Meaning, don't just sit there and try to passively absorb everything. You know, you have you have to seek out extra stuff. Ask questions, you know, as, where it's appropriate in your school, because every school is a little bit different about that. Read books, listen to podcasts, you know, try to m- make your learning martial arts an active process. Don't make it through osmosis, because that will take you longer and you just won't get as much out of it. Thank you for listening to episode 76 of Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sensei Wilson. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, including an impressive cutting video, the sword cutting through the bamboo that we discussed. I'm probably going to butcher the Japanese, but Temeshigiri. And that was a lot of fun. There's a lot of great stuff out there. We pulled a couple videos. There's also another one from that Scott Adkins movie that Sensei Wilson mentioned called Ninja Shadow of a Tear. So hit the show notes, check those out. Now, if you like the show, make sure you're subscribing or using one of our custom apps. They're available in both iOS and Android. And for those of you kind enough to leave us a review, like C. Robinson did, we read that review in the intro. Remember, we randomly check out the different podcast review sites, though it is primarily iTunes. And if we find your review and mention it on the air, go ahead, email us for your free box of Whistlekick stuff. Now, if you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website as well. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, pretty much everywhere you can think of. And our username is always Whistlekick. Every episode is also available on YouTube, so check us out there if you have a chance. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our comfortable sweatshirts that come in different colors and styles. But that's all from us. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.